All right, let's go ahead and get started again. Uh, second half, Tuesday, the topic is proof by, by cases and contradiction. Proof by contradiction, probably one of my most favorite one. Proof one of my favorite proof techniques. Proof by cases, uh, basically sometimes you may need to break a proof into uh, several parts. So sometimes, suppose you have some statement like uh, P1 or dot, 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 or PK, some set of premises, one of which is true, and you want to show Q. The way you could prove this, this is logically equivalent to proving that each case is true. So we can do like P1 implies Q and, dot, 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 and PK implies Q, right? And where P1 through PK are cases. Uh, now these cases are, must be total. And so they, they break up whatever uh, universe of discourse the problem comes from, the, the input comes from. Uh, it mu it, they must cover all everything. There must not be a missed case. Now that will make more sense as we actually do the problem. Um, for example, let's prove uh, the theorem, four, five, six, if n is any number, then n squared plus n is even. Proof. We say we, we proceed by two cases if n is even or odd. Case one, n is even. If n is even, then n is equal to 2k for some number k. Uh, so uh, n squared plus n is equal to uh, 2k squared plus 2k, which is equal to 4k squared plus 2k which is equal to 2 times 2k squared plus k, right? Since n squared plus n is written as 2 times something, some number, n squared plus n is even. Case two, n is odd. Then n is equal to 2k plus 1 for some number k. So n squared plus n is equal to 2k, square, 2K plus 1 squared plus 2k plus 1, which is going to be equal to uh, 4k squared plus 2k plus 1 plus 2k plus 1, which is equal to 2 times 2k squared plus 2k plus 2 plus 1. Is that correct? Yeah. Since n squared plus n can be written by written as 2 times something, it is even. QED. So this proof, long, ugly, boring, bad. But we're trying to demonstrate proof by cases. Observe that the cases are total. Let's Two great remarks we can make here. First off, when you break a problem up into cases, in each case you get an extra assumption you get to make for free, right? That's not true when you're proving the whole problem in general. When you do case one, you get to assume n is even. That's a huge, that's a great thing, you know? Now notice that n squared plus n is even in both cases. So it doesn't matter if n is even or odd because it's true when n is even and it's true when n is odd. So it's true when n is any number. But 
it's even for different reasons. The math works out slightly differently, but in both cases, it's even. Now, when you write, when you break a problem up into cases, the cases must be total. They must cover all possibilities. You know, there's a very famous example throughout history. They were trying to prove something. Uh, they were they proved um, they proved something to be true when x was greater than zero, and then they also proved it to be true when x was less than zero. Right? I'm trying to remember the details of this problem. They they were able to prove very, with much difficulty with the assumption that the number was positive, some theorem was true. Then somebody else comes along when the number is negative, some uh, the theorem was also true. But they wanted to prove the theorem to be true for all real numbers, for all possible values that could take on. It turns out the whole theorem was false because it was uh, false when uh, x is equal to 0. So the fact that these guys broke the two cases, broke this problem up into two cases, didn't actually end up proving the theorem because the whole theorem was false with x equals 0 was a counterexample. So you would not prove the theorem true in this case, if you broke your cases up into x is positive or x is negative, because it could be true when x is, it could be false when x is zero, right? The cases must be total. Here, every number is even or odd. So that's our, every number is either even, and if it's not even, it must be odd. That's why we know the cases are total. There is no number that's not even and not odd, right? So that's, this is an example of proof by cases, right? Any questions about casing? casing? We break the problem up into things, and we prove both of those are true. This is a p implies q, and then we do this one, which is p implies q, and then therefore we're done. Right. Questions on this case? Proof. This isn't the best way to prove this theorem. n squared plus n is even. If n is any number, then n squared plus n is even. What is a better way to prove n squared plus n is even? You can actually prove that directly without breaking it up into cases, but the point was to demonstrate casing, casing a problem. Uh, what's another way to prove n squared plus n is even? It can be expressed as 2k. Hmm? It can be expressed as 2k. That's what we would hope to conclude. We can re represent as 2 times something. But how would we prove that? What do you know about n squared plus n? Um, n times n plus 1. Correct. What do you know about n times n plus 1? Uh, so... They are, must be two even types. They must be uh, one even and one one odd. Exactly. Let's let's use uh, a, a more a formal uh, language in that. Um, we prove n squared plus n is even. Uh, n squared plus n is equal to n times n plus one. Notice n n plus one are consecutive. Consecutive numbers. So uh, 1 must be even. The other must be odd. So n times n plus 1 is a product of an even number and an odd number and is therefore even. All right. S simple. That proof much shorter than this one. But it relies on uh, 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 something to be noticed, right? n and n plus 1 are consecutive. 2 and 3 are consecutive. 3 and 4 are consecutive. 4 and 5 are consecutive. For any two consecutive numbers, one of them must be even and one of them must be odd. That's true. Now, we notice that we specifically do not make any claim as to which one is even and which one is odd. But we know one of them is even and one of them is odd. So the product n times n plus 1 is a product of an odd number and even number. Now, we don't know which one is odd and which one is even. That's OK. We just know that the product is an even number times an odd number. So we know it must be even. Elegance of the proof writing here. I could have said, well, suppose n is even, and then n plus 1 is odd. And then suppose n is odd, and n plus 1 is even. That's too much. You know, this, it, it, it's terse, but it's correct. And it should convince you that n squared plus n is always even. Right? It's simpler than the cases. Again, there's multiple ways to prove something. You want to go for the elegance. You've got to rewrite a proof three times. 
right? Any questions on this direct proof? Right, we did a proof by cases to show how to break something up. You could prove some, sometimes you can get an even more elegant proof something doing something directly. Right. Questions on that? Awesome. All right, let's suppose you want to do like uh, P implies Q. So what do you know that P implies Q is logically, excuse me, P, not P implies Q, but P if and only if Q. What is P if and only if Q logically equivalent to? Yeah, P implies Q and Q implies P. So P implies Q and Q implies P is the way uh, you could prove an, uh, a biconditional. Let's say you want to prove something is a biconditional. You break it up into the two cases, P implies Q and then Q implies P. Now, that's how you have to prove every biconditional. It is not sufficient for you to prove it only one of them, P implies Q. You have to go back and do two cases and you have to prove both. That's, the, that's a biconditional is a very strong statement. It's twice as strong as a conditional. A P implies Q. So you have to do it twice in some sense. Let's prove the following uh, statement. If N is odd, uh, we'll say N is odd. If and only if N squared is odd. We agree? Uh, we proceed by two cases. That's the theorem. Proof. Uh, we proceed into two cases. When you do an if and only if, sometimes you can denote which one it is by using the arrow itself. So I'm going to put a little arrow like that in parentheses to denote the numbering of that case. Now what is that? We want to prove P implies Q. So we want to prove, we want to prove uh, n is odd implies n squared is odd. Now technically, we already did this, right? We took this as a corollary to the previous one, right? Let's just do it again. This is if and only if. Last time we did, we said if n is odd, then n squared is odd. We did that like a simple corollary. We're going to say actually it's an if and only if. We want to prove n is odd implies n squared is odd. Uh, if n is odd, there is a number k such that uh, n is equal to 2k plus 1. Then n squared is equal to 2k plus 1 squared, which is equal to 4k squared plus 4k plus 1, which is equal to 2 times 2k squared plus 2k plus 1. Since n squared is written as 2 times a number, it is even. Plus 1. Two times the number plus one. Thank you. It is even. Odd. Odd. Sorry, I'm distracted by the computer notification. I need to uh, take a second to do something. Oh, I'm running out of storage space. Oh my god, I don't have any I don't have any storage space left. My recording is going to be bonked. All right. Whew. Um second case we want to prove the reverse of the implication. It's going to be uh, if n squared is odd, then 
n is odd. Now, how should we prove that? When you want to prove, uh, when you break something, anything up into cases, you can handle each case with a different proof technique. So in fact, proving n squared is odd than n is odd is actually tricky. Because what you would do, you may say, OK, let n squared be, let's say you tried to do like n squared is equal to 2k plus 1. And then you're like, n is equal to the square root of 2k plus 1. Something like this. This doesn't work, right? What would you do instead of this? Contrapositive or contraposition, we uh, proceed with the contrapositive, uh, which is that n is even implies n squared is even. Uh, if n is even, then n is equal to 2k for some number k. Then uh, uh, n squared is equal to 2k squared, which is equal to 4k squared, which is equal to 2 times 2k squared. Since n is written as 2 times a number, it is. Uh, even. QED. Right. Okay, so any remarks on the proof? Any questions on the proof before we get into, okay, again, everything we're doing, I write the proof on the board, uh, then we talk about it. We work through the proof. Again, I want to reinforce that this is not something that it's expected of you to do. The way I'm doing it on the board, I already know the answer. When you're trying to prove something, you don't know the answer yet, so you have to like work through the proof. I'm simply showing you the answer, but I'm not showing you the work behind to get the answer, right? The way I had to like figure things out. Um, second is this kind of implicitly does something in the background, right? Uh, we know p if and only if q is logically equivalent to p implies q, and q implies us, uh, uh, p, right? But we took the contrapositive of the second case, so we really didn't do q implies p. We did not p implies not q. And what that is means is logically in the background we did this. p implies q and not p implies not q. Now you can't take this as a law of thought, but this is true, right? Would you believe that p implies q and not p implies not q? It's the same thing as p if and only if q. This is implicitly what we did instead of this one, right? That's when we took the contrapositive of the second case, we replaced Q implies P with not P implies not Q to continue the proof. Question? So it would be like not Q implies not P. Ah, but we're taking the contrapositive of the reverse of the if and only if. The reverse of the if, the if and only if, though, the only if part is, is Q implies P. So the contrapositive of Q implies P is you reverse it again. So it's not P implies not Q. Now, had we taken the contrapositive of the first case, it would have been not Q implies not P. Right. Do we see that why this is true? Right. Uh, second thing is we get an immediate corollary, right? You know that P if and only if Q is equivalent to not P if and only if not Q. Right? P if and only if Q is equivalent to not P if and only if not Q. So let's take the actual theorem, which says n is odd if and only if n squared is odd. What is the not P if and only if not Q? What is not p? p is n is odd, right? So n is not odd. What does that mean? Yeah. So what is the whole, what is the corollary? n is even if and only if n squared is even. Yes. Do we see that to be true? n is even if only if n squared is even. We'll use that fact later. But that certainly is useful. If n, we know that n squared then has the same parity as n, right? That's what the and if and only if really means here. n is odd if and only if n squared is odd. So you know if n squared is odd, then you know n is odd. If n squared is even, you know n must have been even, and so on, right? Questions on that one? So that's proof by cases. 
Uh, let's go on to proof by contradiction. Proof by contradiction, probably one of my favorite proof techniques of all time. It's kind of a, uh, a, an absurd one. You, um, uh, to prove uh, p, what you do is you prove that the negation of p must imply an absurdity. The absurdity is a statement so obvious, so obviously wrong, it cannot, no one would ever concede it to be true. There's no ambiguity if it's wrong or not. Here I represent the absurdity as 0 equals 1. 0 equals 1 is obviously false. To prove a proof by contradiction, you derive valid rules using valid rules and inferences and make sure your proof is correct. You derive something that's not true, but you de derive it using the rules of truth, so therefore you have a contradiction. Therefore, so we know that if not p implies 0 equals 1, then this implies p. It must be the case that p is true. If p being false leads to an absurdity, then it must be the case that p is true. And again, I want to stress how absurd the absurdity must be when you write the proof. It has to be so obviously wrong that it, there's no way it could be true. It's not often it'll literally be 0 equals 1. Sometimes it'll be a, a negation of an axiom that you assume to be true. right? Sometimes it'll be the negation of a premise you assume to be true. But it's obviously, to the reader, something that is unambiguously wrong. When you do a proof by contradiction, you flip the whole world upside down and you shake it out until you see that we lose the meaning of what truth is itself. That's why what a proof by contradiction really is. Um, and it, it, because of that, it allows a kind of creativity uh, that other kinds of proofs uh, don't have. Um, any questions on just the, the, the introduction of what a proof by contradiction is? A proof by contradiction also has a more specific syntax when you're discussing something. Because you're discussing truth relative to a world without truth. So you have to begin a little more denotionally. You have to say, uh, every proof begins with assume to the contrary. And then it concludes with contradiction. You have to begin the proof with assume to the contrary, or you can begin the proof with suppose not. But it must be denoted when the proof begins, like when something, uh, uh, when the proof begins, when you're argue, arguing the negative, and then you say contradiction when you stop arguing the negative. Right? So let's just do an example. Um, uh, theorem. There is no largest number. Uh, that's true, obviously. How would you prove it to be true? If I didn't teach you the method of contradiction, how would you prove that there is no largest number? Assume there is a largest number. That's that. proof by contradiction. If you don't have proof by contradiction, oh. think about the other strategies we know so far. Let's say there exists an n such that um, n is greater than, or n plus 1 is greater than n. How would you prove that? So sometimes proofs, when you're at the low level, are so simple it's actually hard to assert their truth. That's one of them. How would you prove that n plus 1 is greater than n? Well, subtract n from both sides, and you get n 1 greater than 0. And Well, OK, so I'm not sure if I, we asserted truth there, right? Something like this. Sometimes proof by contradiction is really powerful, because you have no other way to prove. Sometimes you have no other way to prove things than contradiction. There are certain things that can only be proved by contradiction. This is not one of those things. I think there is a way to prove this directly. But we could prove this simply by contradiction. Again. Emphasis on proof writing is about elegance. Contradiction is going to be that way. Assume to the contrary. You assume to the contrary, you take the negation of the statement. So the negation of the statement, there is a largest number. And we'll call that largest number n. OK, assume to the contrary, uh, there is a largest number, n. Uh, consider 
that uh, n plus 1 is a number when n is a number. So n plus 1 is a number when n is a number. Since n plus 1 is greater than n, then n plus 1 is larger than n, contradicting the uh, fact that n is the largest number. So here, we said assume to the contrary there is a largest number n. n plus 1 is larger than n, contradicting the assumption that n is the largest number. If for any largest number there is, if someone says, I have the largest number, you say, no, I have a number bigger, n plus 1. Right? Uh, the, what is the contradiction here? The absurdity is the premise. We assume to the contrary that there did exist a largest number. So we know that all numbers are less than it. Yet we found one number that was bigger than it. Contradiction. That's our contradiction. Right? Any questions on the syntax of the proof? We began, importantly, with the phrase assume to the contrary. Sometimes you can begin with the phrase suppose not or something. But the beginning of the proof is always denoted by assume to the contrary. The end of the proof is uh, always denoted by, an by what the contradiction actually is. Sometimes it's just the word contradiction. you know. But it should be clear to the writer what was the absurdity. Questions on this proof? We'll do some more proof by contradiction, the topic of today's contradiction. Um, make sure I have this next one. Uh, if uh, x and y are positive real numbers, then uh, the square root of x plus y does not equal the square root of x plus the square root of y. Right? So let x and y be positive real numbers. They're non-zero. Uh, we want to prove uh, that for every two positive real numbers, x and y, that x plus, the square root of x plus y is, does not equal the square root of x plus the square root of y. We want to prove that. Now, how would you prove this without contradiction? I don't actually know. Uh, but the point of proof by contradiction, again, is elegance. Do you believe we could prove this by contradiction? Before we get into that, what is the, unit, what is the quantification over the statement? I've presented it in English, but how would you formalize that? Assume to the contrary that. Uh, well, before we get into the, what the proof structure is, that's what we'll do in a second. What, how would you express the quantification of the theorem itself? Um, is x and y, or is there a for all or there exists? For all x and for all y, um, x, the square root of x plus y does not equal root x plus root y. Right. It's important, implicitly, I want to emphasize this because this is one that doesn't include the word all, every, for each. But when the quantifier, when the elements are over a universe of discourse and there is no, no obvious quantification, it's for every element in the universe of discourse. The for all is the default quantifier. Not that there exists x and y, so that's x plus y does not equal the square root of x plus square root of y, but for all, yes? But uh, since you have like a, like a conditional that it's positive real, would you have to like specify such that, or? Yeah, and you could specify it, or you could say the universe of discourse is here. So instead, I could have said something like this. X. I could have said, like, x greater than 0 and y greater than 0 implies that, right? That's another way to do it. Um, but... The universe of discourse we'll have to talk about on Thursday. The universe of discourse here could be understood to be uh, positive reals. Right. 
Uh, right. So let's proceed by a proof by contradiction. Now, when you take, the, you take the negation of a statement, you take the negation of a universally quantified statement, you have an existential statement. So we simply need to, when we assume to the contrary, we're simply going to get that there exists two, some number x and some number y. Assume to the contrary, there exists x. Is this positive reals, positive real numbers, x comma y, such that uh, the square root of x plus y is equal to the square root of x plus square root of y, right? Yeah. One quick comment. When you're negating an implication here, what is the negation of an implication? What is, what is the way to re represent P implies Q? Not P and not Q. P and not Q. I'll work it out. We'll go not P or not Q. Not, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Not P or Q, which is P and not Q. So often when you negate an implication, you can just say, suppose P but not Q. So here, this is our P. X and Y are positive reals. But the negation of Q here which is that the x plus y, square root of x plus y is equal to square root of x plus square root of y, right? This is our p. We're doing p, and we're doing not q, right? So assume to the contrary that x and y exist. Simply, from here, we proceed with arithmetic. We know then that the square root of x plus y is equal to the square root of x plus square root of y for some specific numbers, x and y. Then we know that uh, that implies that x plus y is equal to square root of x plus square root of y squared, right? Simple arithmetic. Well, that implies that x plus y is equal to, let's FOIL that out. What is that going to be? x plus 2x squared y squared plus y. Right? So you're going to get the FOIL first, outer, inner, last. You're going to get square root, of, square root of x. You're going to get square root of y, square root of y. Then you're going to get square root of x times square root of y, square root of x times square root of y. You're going to get 2 square root of x, y. You agree? Well, look at that. We have an x and an x. We have a y and a y. So let's just cancel terms. We get then that, uh, so uh, we know that uh, 2 square root of x, y is equal to 0. Do we agree? We subtract x, y from both sides. x plus y from both sides. Which implies that square root of x, y is equal to 0. Which implies, by squaring both sides, that x, y is equal to 0. You guys know the name of the axiom, the rule, you may have learned in pre-calculus of what this implies about x and y? What do you know about x and y here? One of them is 0. One of them is 0. What's the name of the rule? This is a trivia question, not a really math question. I was going to if anyone remembers the name of that. Why is one of them zero? It's called the zero product property. Since uh, x, y is equal to zero by the zero product property, one of x or y, or even both, it's inclusive or, uh, must be 0. Contradiction with our assumption that both x, y are positive. Reals. Do we observe what the contradiction is here? It's a little more subtle. The contradiction here is that we, ass that we assumed that both x and y are positive reals. 
we conclude that 1 of x or y or both is 0, and 0 is not positive. That's contradicting our assumption. In some sense, we've, we assumed p and not q, and we deduced not p. Right? Questions on this proof by contradiction? We see the syntax again. I begin with assuming to the contrary, and I end with what the contradiction actually is. It's important that all proofs you do follow this syntax, or at least for the proof by contradiction. All right, let's do another proof by contradiction. Any more pr questions on that one? Questions on proof by contradiction in general? So let's, again, uh, yap about history. Uh, Pythagoras, different ancient Greek guy, uh, founded the Pythagorean theorem. Other people found it before him, unfortunately, but we still call it the Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem, you know the statement of the Pythagorean theorem? A squared, a squared plus B squared equals C squared, where these are the sides of the right triangle and C is the hypotenuse, right? There was this, you may have heard of a story in the news recently. Two high schoolers discovered a new proof of the Pythagorean theorem using the law they only use the law of sines instead of the laws of cosines. So what they did is they came up with a geometric proof of the Pythagorean theorem using basically what we're talking about in this lecture. Um, but there, there, there's like, uh, throughout history, there's been like a thousand proofs of the Pythagorean theorem. Um, but theirs is pretty unique because it doesn't use a certain axiom. People didn't know if you could prove it without using that axiom, and they were able to do that. So it's kind of interesting. Um, among the questions about, about, about the Pythagorean theorem is what is the side length of a right triangle whose lengths are 1, a un with unit length, right? So let's see this be the length of the hypotenuse of the right angle uh, of a right triangle with side lengths 1. What is C? Root square root of 2. You say C is square root of 2. What I'm going to say is that C squared is equal to 2, OK? What you do is when you say square root of 2, you know you have a good definition of a, of a number. What, what is a number? It's some sort of quantity. It's r a real number. Uh, you know the difference between rational and irrational numbers. Pythagoras didn't. Pythagoras comes from the school of thought. He led this mathematical cult. Uh, the school of thought was like, um, the only, there's only numbers, and there's only ratios of numbers. So like 2 and 3 and 7 and 100 are numbers. But, and then you, they didn't have the concept of what we have today as any kind of decimal quantity. They had, instead of 2 over 3, we understand that today as a, as a fraction. If you have 2 thirds of something, you have a pi, and you have 2 thirds of the pi. This is not what the Pythagoreans thought. They, they had it as a ratio, uh, 2 to 3. So basically this means not that you have 2 thirds of a pi, of 1 pi, but if you had 3 pi's, 2 of them were allocated to you. Right? There's a difference between these. And the, the, he had this idea that there were no numbers. The only concept Pythagoras had of a number was either a number, a whole number, today as we understand it, or a ratio of two numbers. Not even a fraction, not even a part. There's no such thing as a part. There's only wholes and relationships of wholes. That's the only things that existed to him. He didn't understand anything about that. That kind of makes sense, though. If you have rocks, you have two rocks. What does it mean? What is half a rock? Half a rock is just a rock, right? So that kind of makes sense to him. Um, and unfortunately, this, is a, this was a really difficult question. Like, well, OK, you have the Pythagorean theorem. We know that 1 squared plus 1 squared is equal to c squared. So what is c? As a, if Pythagoras was true, every quantity has to be represented as a ratio of something. And there was some pretty decent approximations of the square root of 2 using rational numbers. I have uh, c is approximately. Uh, 577 over 408. I think this is the ancient Egyptians. I think the ancient Indians had C is approximately uh, 305, 470 over 216,000, right? But again, these were computed. I think one of these was ancient Egyptians, one of these was ancient Indians. I don't actually remember which one was which. But these are both approximations. They're not exact. And today, we have a good, under, a modern understanding of an of a irrational number. A number is irrational if it cannot be represented as a fraction. 
And we know that the square root of 2 is irrational. But Pythagoras didn't know this. In comes the strength of proof. He thought that someone else would figure out what the, what the ratio was. What was the actual rational number that c was equal to? And through a simple proof by contradiction, you can show that actually there is no such ratio. So we proceed by his student Hippasus' proof. Assume to the contrary that the square root of 2 is, is rational. Uh, then there is uh, uh, numbers uh, a and b such that the square root of 2 is equal, is equal to a over b with a over b in reduced So what are we saying here? Assume to the contrary that the square root of 2 is a rational number. It's a ratio. It's a third, a fifth, whatever it is. Uh, by reduced form, we simply mean that you've reduced the fraction to the smallest thing. There is nothing that divides both a and b. For example, if you had uh, 3 over 6, you could reduce that to 1 half, right? If you had 2 over 8, you could reduce that to, what, 1 fourth, and so on. A fraction is said to be reduced if you, you can't simplify it any further. These are called non, these are unreduced fractions. These are reduced. So suppose that a and b are reduced, right? Um, so if the square root of 2 is equal to a, b, then we proceed. What are we going to do? We're going to square both sides. So we're going to say then that the square root, uh, if the square root of 2 is equal to a over b, then we know that 2 is equal to a squared over b squared. Do we agree? Question so far. We understand that to be true. Again, we're arguing a proof by contradiction. Uh, so then we know that b squared is equal to a squared. 2b, 2b squared is equal to a squared. Right? So, uh, so a squared is even. a squared is even because it's written as 2 times something. What do we know about a squared? If a squared is even, what do we know about a? a is also even. That's the corollary we proved. N is even if only if n squared is even. So if a squared is even, a must be even. That implies that a is even. So a is equal to 2k uh, for some number k. Uh, then we go uh, 2b squared is equal to uh, a squared which is equal to 2k squared, right? Which is equal to 4k squared. Then we have 2b squared is equal to 4k squared uh, implies that b squared is equal to 2k squared. So b squared is even implies that b is even. Right? So a is even, and b is also even. Contradiction. We assumed a over b were in reduced form. So they both cannot be even. Questions on that proof? There's some comments we could make about this. First off is the assumption that may have not been clear if you were trying to do this yourself. We, we added in a little thing there, which ended up being what we contradict with. The fact that a over b is in reduced form. We didn't start with a over b is just any fraction, any, any ratio, any rational number. We said a over b is in reduced form. And every rational can, has a reduced form, obviously. But whatever reduced form you can write square root of 2 in, you can reduce it, which is a contradiction. Now, today we observe this as a contradiction, but the ancient Greeks observed this 
as uh, a proof by infinite descent. You cannot reduce a number infinitely, right? Suppose, OK, well, you say, suppose a and b are both even. So let a is equal to 2k, b equals 2l, and then you say, OK, 2k over 2l, I'm going to consider k over l, right? So if square root of 2 is equal to a over b, and if those are even, there is equal to 2k over 2l, which is equal to k over l, right? Then you repeat the proof for square root of 2 is equal to k over l. What's going to happen is you redo the proof again for k and l, and you say k and l are both even. You reduce them further, you reduce them further, you reduce them further. You cannot infinitely reduce numbers, right? So they would have remarked the contradiction here as a proof by infinite descent. You cannot, you cannot infinitely reduce numbers this way. Today we observe this as simpler as a contradiction, you know? Uh, the absurdity here is, is that uh, a, a fraction cannot be reduced with both the numerator and denominator being even, right? So this, this is a proof that the square root of 2 is even, but it's actually historic. This is a really famous proof. And uh, not only does it assert that the square root of 2 is irrational, but it ex asserts the existence of irrational numbers. There must exist quantities, naturally occurring quantities, that are not represented as ratios. So Pythagoras had these visions, these visions of beauty of what nature was about. It was simply whole numbers and ratios of whole numbers with music notes and everything like this. And that every naturally occurring quantity had to be one which was either a number or a ratio of numbers. Yet here we can construct a very simple example of a length which cannot be represented as a ratio. So here we've destroyed Pythagoras' visions of beauty of, of what the, the universe ought to look like. And Pythagoras was very upset, supposedly Hippasus, the guy, the little student who came up with this proof, um, and you, know, you can figure something out like this drawing in the sand. It's, it's not too hard. He, uh, Pythagoras had him drowned. He took him out on the boat, and he threw him in the ocean. And um, you know, Pythagoras was supposed to be this great logician, but he had to uh, resort to violent methods to, to maintain his, his image. When we behave rationally, though, we would, we would see a proof like this and take this as evidence that our own assumptions must have been wrong about what the universe was, was supposed to look like in terms of numbers. So this is a, a classic, classic proof by contradiction, right? Good one to know. Questions on this proof? All right, I have one more proof uh, for you today. And it's the proof that, uh, it's, again, another classic Greek proof. Uh, this is due to Euclid. Uh, there are infinitely many prime numbers. You guys know what a prime number is? You guys recall the definition of a prime number? What is the definition of a prime number? Prime number is a number whose only divisors are itself in one. Yes. So what are the first few prime numbers? Two, three, five, seven, not 9, uh, not 10, 11, 13, not 15, 17, and so on, right? So there's the f these numbers have no divisors. Nothing divides into these numbers except 1 and except itself, right? Uh, none of these can be written as a product of two things that are smaller than it besides uh, the number itself, right? So how would you prove there's infinitely many prime numbers? The classic proof of Euclid is, you do the, uh, is, is also a proof by contradiction. So assume to the contrary. Uh, there are finitely many prime numbers. Uh, P1 to PK, right? Consider the number uh, n is equal to p1 times p2 times times pk, the product of all the primes plus 1.
right? Since uh, there are only finitely many primes, and n does not equal any of them, it's none of p1. It's definitely greater than p1. It's greater than p2. It's greater than p3. It's greater than p4, certainly, right? Because it's greater than all of those numbers. It's none of them. Since n does not equal any of them, n is not prime, right? Uh, n is not prime. What do we know about n? It is composite. Right? So uh, some uh, prime number Uh, P divides into uh, N with P equaling P1 or P2 or a PK, right? So we assume that, we know that N is not prime, so N is composite, so N has a divisor. If N is composite, it has a divisor that's just, that's not one or itself. So we know that the divisor it has some divisor p. So p divides into n. Also, p divides into capital P is equal to uh, p1 times p2 times dot, 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 times pk. Because it's one of those. It must be one of those, right? So it divides into n and it divides into p. It divides into n minus p. So P divides into N minus P. What is N minus P? Well, N is going to be uh, P1 to PK plus 1 minus P1 PK, right? Which is just equal to 1. So P divides into 1. Contradiction. No prime number divides into one. QED. Classic proof by Euclid of the infinitude of primes. There's infinitely many prime numbers. If you assume there's only finitely many prime numbers, then uh, bad things happen. That's basically what happens. Note it doesn't tell us what the prime numbers are. It doesn't tell us how to find the prime numbers. It doesn't tell us what the next prime number is. It doesn't tell us anything like this. And in fact, still today, we don't know what the largest prime. We, we're still looking for larger and larger prime numbers. It's a big computational task. They're throwing supercomputers at this. Yet we know that the sequence of prime numbers is infinite. It can never, is, there's no like largest prime, and then you're done. Right? Any questions on this proof? Right? We construct a number. Uh, that must, that's not any of the prime numbers, and then we show that there is a prime number that divides into one, which is impossible. Contradiction. Again, obs observe how crazy the absurdity is. We, it's basically zero equals one. It's not something that, it's so obviously wrong, the reader is forced to conclude that, that uh, the proof by contradiction is correct. If there's no questions, that's all we have for class today.